Hello again, and another happy Thanksgiving Eve to everyone. We have a science fact double feature today, unlike the science fiction double feature that some of you may have seen with Tim Curry in it. And we're not talking science facts like the facts you see on social media where they're actually just opinions masquerading as fact, but someone found a scientist to say it. Oh no, no, these are factual facts. So that's pretty cool. All right, today we're gonna to talk about Cauchy's theorem for the existence of stress. Stress in the sense of a tensorial stress, stress being a tensor field. And basically we're going to come up with a couple assumptions on the nature of that surface traction field that we talked about in the previous lecture earlier today. I'm sure, well, I hope that you guys all see these lectures on some day, uh, not today, and that you're having a good break. But, you know, this is, I have some free time, so let's do it. At any rate, under those assumptions, um, which are reasonable ones, as is evidenced by the fact that this theory works for pretty much all materials that humans have ever encountered, um, <clears throat> then you can prove that the surface traction field has to be a tensor field. So let's kind of write that down. So the surface traction field is a function of three arguments. It takes the first argument of a direction, or we'll call it like differential surface area vector, <coughs> takes an argument of a point in space and time, and it returns the force per unit area acting from the side of the surface toward which n points um, the force from that onto the uh, side out of which n points. All right, so given that surface traction field and a couple smoothness assumptions, um, it must take the form of a tensor field. Yeah, let's make those all super uppercase there. Let's move that one down a little bit. Like that. And so that's pretty cool because this one we can use the divergence theorem on that surface integral. Whereas this surface integral, we were stuck like, you know, you could have an integral theory for balance of <coughs> linear and angular momentum, but it related a surface integral to a, uh, a surface integral of this thing that you can't really apply the divergence theorem to, um, to a volume integral of something involving the body force. Well, now this, <clears throat> we can apply the divergence theorem to, and then we can apply the localization theorem and come up with a local form for the balance of linear and angular momentum, which is far more useful if you would like to, say, 
solve for the displacement or velocity field anywhere. All right, so we're going to prove Cauchy's theorem in a bit. But basically, what it shows um, is, so we had said balance of linear momentum. We had the integral <clears throat> over the boundary of T and dA, the surface traction, plus the integral over the body of the generalized body force, which includes the inertia. That equals 0, and that is vector 0. Uh, for all p t is equal to chi p t p in the reference body fixed. All right. <clears throat> well, basically, what Cauchy's theorem does or what makes it tick is the fact that if we make p sub t really small but also regularly shaped so that as it gets small its boundaries area gets small so its volume gets small and its area also gets small so we're not talking about you know making some stupid squiggly shape where it keeps getting squigglier and squigglier so the <clears throat> surface area doesn't decrease as it gets smaller. Um, things like that don't really end up being useful in continuum physics. Those are more mathematical tricks to, you know, examine whether a, a proof works. Um, and they're important, but that doesn't apply here because here we are sticking with the, the notion of nice smooth things. All right, so so if if that's the case, then these are both going to have to go to zero individually um, as the volume gets small because this integral is going to, well, you know, some constant, the average value of v times the volume, and this is the average value of tn <clears throat> times the surface area. Um, so this one scales differently than this one in as much as the surface area goes with, say, delta squared while the volume goes with delta cubed. And so that's kind of central to the whole thing working out is basically it's not that the combination of these goes to zero as the volume goes to zero. It's that each of them individually <clears throat> also has to vanish. Don't do that. All right, so on to the proof. And like I mentioned at the end of last lecture, this is a pretty lengthy proof, but it is probably the, it might be the most important result in continuum mechanics. Um, because without it, the other really important results kind of don't get you anywhere. It's up there with the principle of virtual work. But Cauchy's theorem is probably a little bit more important. Maybe the dissipation equality is more important. But that would be about it. All right, so given any point x in the spatial configuration, so the deformed body. <clears throat> and let's restrict our attention to an x in the interior of the deformed body, so not in the boundary. That's what that little circle above it means is interior. 
and an arbitrary orthonormal spatial basis. So we have E1, E2, and E3. <clears throat> and a unit vector A, such that its inner product with all of them is greater than zero. We'll make it a hat. Pretty much guarantee I'll forget to put the hat over the A. So if I do, remember that it's the same A. We're saying it's unit magnitude. A dot, whoopsies. So A dot EI, this is strictly greater than zero for all I. And so what we're saying there is make, we'll make this a 2D example so you can show, well, so I can draw it more easily. So if this is say the E1 direction, I suppose actually in coordinates that would be X1. And this is X2, so E1 is gradient of X1 and E2 is gradient of X2. <clears throat> At any rate, what we're saying is that A could be, you know, here or here. So those are okay. Um, A cannot be here. And it cannot be along the axis because then its inner product with E2 would be zero, and likewise it can't be along the x2 axis, or its inner product with e1 would be zero. <clears throat> so what it's saying is that we're talking about an A that falls in <clears throat> what we in <clears throat> high school would probably call the first quadrant if we did one, two, three, four. <clears throat> so same deal in 3D, except that instead of quadrant, I guess it would be an octant, and it's only one of those eight. Um, and that'll be the last thing in the proof that we end up unbreaking is making it <coughs> apply to all vectors A instead of ones in just that first octant there. All right, so back, uh, back to our kind of starting point. All right, so given a point X, an orthonormal basis, <coughs> and a unit vector that we'll say is in the first octant defined by that orthonormal basis, then we can, for each delta greater than zero, define a tetrahedron that has vertex at x. One of the faces has a unit, or has a, a, a normal, an outward normal in the a direction, and the other faces lie in the coordinate planes spanned by these guys here. So let's write that out. All right, so this is a spatial tetrahedron, <clears throat> and the book makes it a nice, fancy, italicized T, and I apologize, I just could not, for the life of me, figure out a way to, with my own hand, write an italicized one that wasn't a cursive scripty one. So, understand that this is a spatial tetrahedron and not a reference tetrahedron. T delta... with a vertex at x 
Yeah, let's call that point x naught for now. x naught. Three faces. <coughs> or equivalently in the planes normal to them. Um, and the final face defined by outward unit normal A. All right, so a consequence of this is that the entire tetrahedron is going to live in that first octant defined by our orthonormal basis EI. Let's draw it over here. I suppose it's easiest to start by drawing that outermost triangle. All right, and so these directions are E1, E2, E3. This point, which is, you know, behind us, that's what I meant to imply with the dotted lines, is that they are hidden. Um, that's x naught. Right, and let's say that we have, that looks pretty good right there. So this dotted purple line is the part that's inside the tetrahedron. And then this is the part that's outside. So this is the unit vector A, you know, so that's the area normal to that one. <clears throat> and um, so this, this distance here, the perpendicular distance along A between x naught and, you know, this, this face here with outward normal A, we'll call that distance delta. And so that's what we mean by T sub delta. So, you know, we, we make that distance delta. And, you know, you can make this tetrahedron as small as you would like by making delta as small as you would like. And you can see, right, so if, um, if A were to say point along pretty darned close to E3, then, you know, if you pick a value of delta, like that tetrahedron is going to go pretty darn far out in one of these two directions, but it's going to go finitely far out. Um, so you can always, as long as it's not fully aligned with one of these, you can always pick delta small enough so that like if we pick some, you know, sphere around X naught, <clears throat> we can always pick delta small enough that this tetrahedron is going to lie inside of that, which is good because that means that if x naught is in the interior of the body, 
we can make this entire tetrahedron T delta um, inside the body. All right, so now we're going to denote the faces. of T sub delta. And we're going to call them S for surface. Um, <clears throat> once again, the book is good at making italicized S's. I cannot make an italicized S for the life of me. So again, please understand that these are spatial surfaces and not reference configuration surfaces. So we have S1 delta. <clears throat> oh, no, not. No, no. Nix that one. Just S delta. S sub delta, the face normal to A. Right, so S1, or er, S delta is this face, S1 delta, the face with normal minus E1. So that would be this face here. And the same thing, S2 delta, the face with normal minus E2. Minus E2. And so this is, of course, outward normal. And finally, S3 delta. All right, <clears throat> so as I mentioned, um, if x naught is in the interior of the body, then we can pick a delta naught greater than zero so that t of delta naught is inside the body. So lies entirely in the interior. All right, before we get too much further along, because um, we'll need this in a bit, if the area of the S1 so scalar area is a sub delta, or in this case, delta naught, then the area s i delta, so the face in the i direction, is equal to a sub delta, so the area of this face times a dot ei, the unit vector in that direction, um, the magnitude of that. This is for the scalar area. And so all, all that that is saying, um, that might, if you don't see exactly why, 
look a little weird. Um, but all it's saying is that the area of this face, if we think of it as an area vector along the E1 direction, right? Well, that is, um, you know, the, the opposite <clears throat> of if we projected this area normal vector here, but in the opposite sense, if we projected that into the plane defined by E2 and E3, right? So it's the projected area. And so that's why you get the magnitude of this area times A dot, you know, the normal vector to that, um, the one that it's going to. So that's all that that is. Um, all right. So back to where we were before, let's uh, decide that we pick a fixed delta naught greater than zero so that T sub delta naught lies entirely in the interior of our body. All right, well, if that's the case, then we can find a scalar kappa greater than zero, but finite. Satisfying. The magnitude of the integral over t delta. Note that this is delta and not delta naught. So this could be t delta if at this point could be bigger or smaller than t delta naught, but it's got the same area normal vector. So we're basically talking about, you know, we keep these side faces here and we're just moving this face out this way or back in this way to squish it or make it bigger. Um, all right, so the integral over that, and remember this is a spatial volume, the generalized body force, dv, is less than or equal to kappa times the volume of t delta. This is for all zero less than delta less than or equal to delta naught. So delta naught is fixed, and we're just saying that we can find a kappa that that's always going to be the case. Um, and you, know, you should look at that with a little suspicion, like, well, but things can be continuous, but not absolutely continuous, and blah, 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 if you have taken real analysis before. And then it's like, okay, so like, if I can find some kappa that satisfies that, then I will myself be satisfied with this stipulation. And so, well, let's pick kappa equal the maximum value of x in t delta naught, the big one, um, of the magnitude of b. That'll do it. And if you're into real analysis, that'll do it because t of delta naught is a compact set and b we've stipulated is a continuous function. So, you know, 
it doesn't matter whether we pick supremum or max here. This here continuous function, the magnitude of B, achieves its maximum value somewhere on T of delta naught. It's finite. And since it's continuous, you know, when we integrate the whole thing, that the whole deal is going to be bounded in magnitude by this times the volume of T delta. And that'll apply for any subregion since the magnitude of B on any subset of T delta is never going to be any bigger than it is at most on T delta. So that's pretty cool. We got like a value that works for kappa. You know, we didn't just postulate its existence. We gave a form for it. All right. Well, then in light of linear momentum balance, we can take the magnitude of the whole thing And so we have this. So we'll write out the thing leaving some space for what's about to happen. So we got the integral over <clears throat> not P. No, 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 now it is T sub delta of the surface traction dA integral T delta B dV. All right, so you'll remember that the balance of linear momentum guarantees that for T delta, a spatial tetrahedron that's going to convect with the body. So, you know, if the body's moving in a moment, T won't be a tetrahedron, but it is for now, which turns out to be mighty convenient since it has planar faces that have constant area vectors. Um, at any rate, you know, this plus this has to equal zero. So this equals minus this. So they have to have the same magnitude. So the magnitude of that is equal to the magnitude of that. And we have just shown that that is less than or equal to the volume, or rather k kappa, times the volume of t delta. <clears throat> Turn the page over here. All right, so that means that we can consider this one being less than or equal to this separately from this one being less than or equal to this, which is good. So we have the magnitude of the integral over the boundary. of the surface traction is less than or equal to kappa times the volume of T delta. All right, well, we can divide this both sides by the positive number strictly positive number a delta, which is the area of this, come on, this face. 
And so we have that. Right, and so a delta is going to scale with delta squared. Because delta is, you know, a characteristic width or height or length dimension of our tetrahedron. <clears throat> T N a well that is less than or equal to k times the volume t sub delta so that scales with delta cubed over a sub delta which scales with delta squared <clears throat> so what this tells us is that 1 over a delta dA. Its magnitude is proportional to delta as delta goes to zero. All right, so then that whole thing has to go to zero as delta goes to zero. Let's see if we can save ourselves some. So that whole thing now goes to vector zero. And so that can only be the case if this integral here vanishes faster than a delta. You know, so it could go with delta cubed, but that integral cannot go with delta squared, or this whole thing would go to a constant. All right, so. In light of that, we can write out, you know, so, so, so what we're saying is that um, the integral We'll say it is O delta squared in the sense that it vanishes faster <clears throat> than delta squared. All right, so we're, we're going to be able to say that that integral goes to zero. But let's write it out now as a sum of the integrals over the faces of the tetrahedron, each of which has constant area normal. So we have that the integral over the entire boundary of the surface traction is equal to the integral over S delta, the face that has unit normal A, T A dA plus the sum I going from 1 to 3 integral S I delta, so the face normal to the ith coordinate direction, T, oopsies, we forgot a minus there, right, because the outward unit normal is minus EI on those faces, <clears throat> dA.
All right, the area of the faces SI delta, we had already said, um, but we'll write it out. So these are the scalar areas. S, I, delta are respectively We'll call it the area of S I delta is equal to a delta magnitude of A dot E I. All right, so as delta goes to zero, we have that, you know, T, well, N is constant on a face. And so, you know, T in the sense of it being a function of X, it's continuous. So it has to be pretty close to constant over the face. So it's integral over say S delta has to basically look like its value at X naught acting on A times the area. <clears throat> so we have that one over a delta integral over s delta, so just the face with outward unit normal a of t n dA is going to approach t a x naught t because the integral minus this one over a is going to look like a times that plus things that go away with order delta like the same you know it would be the gradient of t with respect to x times delta so that'll go away um, so that's where that comes from So T X A T minus T oh, that should be A X minus T A X naught T becomes proportional to delta, uh, since it's, you know, the, the gradient times that. Right, so this whole gradient deal here it might be any tensor right but it it's going to be finite in magnitude uh, so it's going to map this to some you know that the length of this <clears throat> is going to be some finite multiple of the length of that <clears throat> all right well let's revisit that same notion here, but apply it to the other four faces. But now instead of dividing by that faces area, we're going to divide all of them, whoopsies, by the same A sub delta, so the area of the face with outward unit normal A. <coughs> so one over A delta integral over S I delta of the surface traction. Well, that's going to go to A dot 
PI. which is a positive number, right, because we've said that has to be the case, times t of minus ei, because that is our unit normal, x naught and t. All right, so therefore, if we consider where did it all go? Basically taking one over a delta yeah, we're, we're, we're taking this here, splitting it over all of the faces and showing that the whole thing has to go to zero. So what we get is that T of A and X plus the sum I going from one to three of A dot EI times the traction evaluated on the minus EI direction and X is equal to zero. <clears throat> so we're saying, you know, if, if you keep making it smaller and smaller, the whole thing has to apply point wise. <clears throat> um, and this is the point wise relation, but this isn't generally yet. This is only for all unit vectors A Let's write that. For all E I orthonormal satisfying. A dot EI <clears throat> is greater than zero for all I, and then for all X in the interior of our body. So basically what we're saying is that we've proven this result, but only in the case when EI is an orthonormal basis um, such that A lies in its first octant. And so what we want to do is prove that this has to be the case in general, regardless of our choice of orthonormal basis. Um, and so we'll do that by, instead of having it be just the first octant, we'll show that it works in all eight octants except for the coordinate planes. And then if T is a continuous function of the normal direction, well then that's more of a deleted point than it is a whole big missing thing. And so when you have nice smooth functions, it's very easy to fill in a deleted point. Whereas we can't fill in seven of the eight octants from one of them. All right, so we'll put a little box around this next one. Um, T, A, and X. All that we're doing is moving that thing over to the right-hand side equals minus some I going from one to three, A dot, E I T minus E I X. Um, where this is subject to the above stipulations.
All right, so that we got from assuming that t is continuous in x, so we were able to kind of take the limit as things get small and get there. Next, we're going to assume that t is continuous in the normal direction argument, so a. <coughs> So we're going to let A approach E sub alpha with alpha equals 1, 2, or 3. So we're going to pick one of those three coordinate directions, um, which those were arbitrarily chosen. Um, and we're going to say, well, what happens if a approaches one of them. You know, we said that we can already still make it small enough as long as it's not quite equal. So we'll examine the behavior as it gets there. Um, all right, well, in that case, T of A and X, so we've suppressed the time argument because I don't feel like writing it. Um, well, regardless of any of our other stipulations about the orthonormal basis, just based on the fact that it's continuous in the normal direction argument, that has to go to T of E sub alpha and X. Well, we also know that T of A and X is going to approach minus the sum i going from 1 to 3 of e alpha dot e i <clears throat> t minus e i x like that. <clears throat> Um, and the reason we can do that is that, you know, if this is a dot e i and a is approaching e alpha, where alpha is a fixed one, two, or three, um, then, you know, this inner product is going to be continuous with the argument. And so it's going to go smoothly to that, <clears throat> even though we kind of say, remember, this might kind of break as it becomes a degenerate tetrahedron, but we're, we're showing here that it'll be, it'll be all right. All right, so since those have to approach that, then we have that T of E alpha and X has to equal minus the sum I going from one to three of, well, this is delta alpha I, delta alpha I T minus e i x. All right, so that is zero whenever alpha and i are not equal. So we have that t e alpha and x is equal to minus t minus e alpha and x. Knock that off. All right, and so that holds for an arbitrary choice of orthonormal basis, but, you know, it, it sort of is... We can't, we haven't proven it for the whole quadrant. We're only talking about when E alpha is aligned positively with one of the E I's.
but we have shown it now for the whole first quadrant. So let's box that off as our important. Once this is, we'll call it This is for all E alpha with alpha is equal to one, two, or three, given a fixed EI basis. So, yeah, we've only, what this is saying, you know, is, is basically Newton's law that for every action there has to be an equal and opposite reaction. <clears throat> so, you know, the force of the plus side on the minus side has to equal minus the force of the minus side on the plus side sort of deal. Um, but we've only shown it to actually be the case so far when the direction we're looking at is aligned with one of our three orthonormal bases. Now, of course, the orthonormal basis choice is arbitrary, so that should apply always, but we're gonna show it. All right, so the next step in the book is kind of weird. Um, because, you know, it feels like we already proved it at this point that, uh, that T can be represented by a tensor. Um, and we pretty much have, but, you know, the, the next step is going to make it work for the whole space instead of just the first octant given our orthonormal basis. So let's define given any a uh, unit vector equals one. Um, so now our only stipulation is that it is not aligned with any of our basis elements. EI satisfying. So instead of being positive, it could be negative now. We just have that A dot EI is not equal to zero for any I. So A doesn't live in one of the coordinate planes. Um, we can define a new orthonormal basis. with e i star equal the sign s g n of a dot e i so this is plus one if it's positive and minus one if it's negative times e i for all i all right so now regardless of our original basis choice. Provided it satisfied our stipulation that A not lie along one of its coordinate planes. Now the starred basis uh, does satisfy A dot EI star is strictly greater than zero for all I. And so that means that our stuff that we proved for the first octant is going to apply with the EI star one. All right, so T A X is equal to negative I going from one to three, A dot EI star T minus EI 
star and x. All right, well, we showed already because it's aligned Because these EIs here, the starred ones, are members of an orthonormal basis that we're talking about, then we've shown that, um, you know, minus T of minus EI star is equal to T of EI star. But we only showed it when we're talking about the direction associated with our <clears throat> orthonormal basis when A is in the first quadrant. So that is equal to the sum i going from 1 to 3 of a dot ei star t ei star and x. Oh, so now that's starting to look like a, a tensory thing, right? Because we're getting its component. We're basically setting up the components of this one from how it acts on <clears throat> the orthonormal basis. All right, we're going to expand that out into something that's a little long and annoying here, and then we'll get rid of it. So that we can do it in terms of the original EI is equal to the sum going from one to three of the sine. No, not, not with the I. S, G, N. A dot EI and then times A dot EI T All right. So if, um, if a dot ei is negative, then the two, you know, signs here are going to cancel out. And if it's positive, then they're one. Um, so we have then that, let's box this off now. So now t of a and x is equal to the sum i going from 1 to 3 of a dot ei t ei and x. Now this is for all a and uh, for all orthonormal All right, so actually we only proved it for everything except for when A lies along the coordinate planes, but because those are just deleted points <clears throat> and everything is continuous, those are easy to fill in, right? And so we have, in fact, proven it for the whole space. All right, well, given that, that looks like you could probably make a tensor field that does that, couldn't you? So in that case, let's define the tensor field capital T, and it's a spatial tensor field. It's going to map spatial area vectors to spatial force vectors. And so that is the sum i going from 1 to 3 of t of ei and x. So this is given an orthonormal basis. OK, so we've defined a tensor field. And now given any vector n,
we have that t n, and we can get rid of that, is equal to the sum by definition of t, i going from 1 to 3, <coughs> of n dot e i times t of e i. And we had already shown that that has to equal t of n, this t of n. So we've constructed a spatial tensor field, t, called the Cauchy stress that does exactly what the surface traction field does. All right, so that means that we can identify this traction, the surface traction field with the Cauchy stress tensor field. So now, <clears throat> in light of the Cauchy stress, we can do some pretty cool stuff. angular momentum balance can be expressed so first we'll do in the spatial configuration the integral over the boundary of T, the Cauchy stress acting on N dA plus the generalized body force integrated over the volume is equal to vector zero and angular momentum are across T N dA plus R cross B dV is equal to zero. And in the rep, uh, doing the integral in the reference configuration, so we'll say expressing the integrals referentially. linear momentum balance is going to look like this. We're only going to do linear here um, because it's going to get us what we need. So balance of linear momentum is now in the reference configuration T times J F inverse transpose and R D A R plus the integral over P of B J D V R is equal to vector zero. So this, uh, whole mess right here has a special name. It's called the first piola kirchhoff stress, and it's very useful. I think in the textbook they call it the first piola stress, but 
people like to throw as many names on things as possible, so you'll see it be called Piola Kirchhoff many places. It's denoted T sub R, and it is defined as J, which is, you know, the determinant of F times the Cauchy stress times F inverse transpose, so that T R maps area normal vectors in the reference configuration. Two surface traction forces in the spatial configuration. It's supposed to technically force density since you integrated over an area. I'll call that an aerial density in the spatial configuration. So the integral over the surface in the reference configuration of TR and RDAR plus the integral over the volume of the generalized body force times J D V R is equal to vector zero. We can apply the divergence theorem to the balance of linear momentum. Then we have that the integral over P of div T plus B integrated over the volume is equal to zero, or in component form, partial T I J partial X J plus B I D V is equal to zero sub I that's vector zero up there, or in the reference configuration, the integral over the reference volume of now capital D div, so this is the divergence in the reference configuration of T R, put that in my notes, I missed an R there. And then we'll split B up into its, uh, oh yeah, let's also, so now it's going to be plus the conventional one, so without the inertial one minus rho V dot, what did I do here? Did something wrong. Oh, skip the step. That'll get you. All right. Mixing my lines up there. All right, so that plus J times the <coughs> Uh, what would we call that? Not classical. Um, conventional body force, B naught, times the volumetric Jacobian. And then, you know, that 
the density times the volumetric Jacobian gives you the density in the reference configuration. So we'll do rho r v dot d v r is equal to vector zero. All right, and we can define the reference configuration conventional body force as B naught R is B naught times the volumetric Jacobian. And what we get is then the integral over the reference configuration volume of the divergence of the first piola kirchhoff stress plus B naught reference minus, well, V dot is going to be chi double dot, rho R chi double dot, D V R is equal to zero. Since P can be any arbitrary spatial region convecting with the body, we get that those integrands all pointwise have to be zero. And we get that rho v dot is equal to, we'll write down the conservation law form, just so you have it, rho v prime plus div rho v tensor product v <clears throat> is equal to the spatial divergence of the Cauchy stress plus the conventional body force. I can probably fit that all on one line if I... Yeah, we did that great. Move it over a little more. Hey. Mm. Freaking computers. All right. And then the reference configuration one can be rho r chi double dot is equal to material configuration divergence of the first piola kirchhoff stress plus the reference configuration <clears throat> body force, which is just the spatial configuration one times the Jacobian determinant. Or in components, We have rho vi prime, so that's you know the time derivative holding spatial point constant plus uh, partial vi partial x j v j, and we can write that is equal to its conservation law form rho. VI the whole thing prime plus partial derivative with respect to XJ of rho VI VJ. That is equal to partial derivative of TIJ with respect to XJ plus B naught I. And the referential counterpart is, let me put that R back in my notes there. There we go. Rho R <clears throat> K 
chi i double dot is equal to partial t r i j partial not that x. Now this is reference configuration x coordinate j plus b naught in the reference configuration i. So that's pretty cool. Now we have local forms for <clears throat> these, and if we can come up with a way of expressing the Cauchy stress or the first peel kirchhoff stress in terms of state variables like displacement or position or velocity, we'd have ourselves like a nice closed set of equations. Throw in some boundary conditions you could solve for a motion. All right. One more thing we're going to prove today is that um, the Cauchy stress is symmetric. And we're going to do that using a special case of what's called the principle of virtual work, which is the way that the, or rather the principle of virtual power, they call it, which is um, the same as the principle of virtual work, but a little more precise way of doing it, which I feel like I talked about earlier, actually. All right, let's prove that T, the Cauchy stress, is equal to T transpose, the textbook's way, using their special case of the principle of virtual power applied to a rigid velocity field. All right, so that rigid velocity field is W of X and T is equal to alpha of T, the translation velocity, plus lambda of T, the rotational velocity, cross X minus O, um, R equals X minus O in the following discussion that over. <clears throat> All right, so let's let capital lambda be the skew symmetric tensor with axial vector lower case lambda. Again, this is a function only of time, not of space. which is to say that um, capital lambda of t acting on r is equal to lambda of t little one cross r for all r. <clears throat> all right, well, if we take the gradient, the spatial gradient of w, That is equal to the gradient of alpha, which is a function only of time, so that's going to be 0, plus the gradient, we'll say, of the skew symmetric tensor, lambda, which is a function only of t, so that can move out of the gradient of r. <coughs> And so that is equal to lambda of t grad r. And we showed that the gradient of r, the you know position vector, is just the identity. So that is equal to capital lambda of t. Uh, so 
the gradient of w is uniform and it is skew. All right, so our special case of the principle of virtual power, which will denote PVP, uh, this is the rigid velocity one. That the integral over the boundary of the Cauchy stress times n you know, so now we're substituting in the Cauchy stress for our surface traction field. That dot W dA plus the integral over the volume of B dot W dV is equal to zero. And that is for all W equal alpha of T plus lambda of T cross, that is a nasty looking lambda, let's fix that, cross x minus the origin in our frame, uh, rigid. All right, well, we can use the transpose, and then we get um, plus the same all right now we can use the divergence theorem to make that the integral over the volume of div t transpose w which we can expand like we did in the homework into div t <coughs> dot w plus t tensor inner product grad w plus b dot w dv is equal to zero. All right, we can combine some terms there. The integral over the volume div T plus B dot W plus T inner product grad W is T inner product lambda, since grad W is equal to lambda, dV is equal to zero. Well, this whole thing right here is equal to zero, we showed by a balance of linear momentum. All right, so then we have that the integral of t inner product lambda dv is equal to zero uh, for all p subsets of our deformed body. So we can apply the localization theorem and t inner product lambda is equal to zero. Now this is for all lambda that are skew symmetric in skew v. So if t is inner product with every skew symmetric tensor that could possibly exist is zero, then t, the Cauchy stress, has to be symmetric. <clears throat> T is equal to T transpose. We're in components, T i j is equal to T j i. Now, uh, the first Peel Kirchhoff stress is not symmetric, and it's transpose. 
is equal to j f inverse t transpose is equal to j f inverse t which is not equal to the first piola kirchhoff stress all right that's all i got for cauchy's theorem um, and proving that cauchy's stress is symmetric so we'll catch you pretty soon hope you have a good thanksgiving have a good one